Someday down the future, whoever ends up with this car when it leaves my garage, they may choose to restore it. But I hope if and when that happens, they do it with the correct lens so that it's not over restored. So that it really is restored very sympathetically to actually resemble the product that David Brown produced in 1957. Not the object that straw hat folks at Pebble Beach think of it, it should be. My name is Dave Adams and I drive a nasty blue Aston Martin Mark III. What's important to know and remember about the Mark III is that in the Mark III you see numerous really important beginnings and endings for Aston Martin. On the beginning side, this Mark III, the prototype, is the first Aston to carry a number of design features that became trademarks. It's the first one with this grille, it's the first one with this dash binnacle, it's the first Aston Martin road car with four-wheel disc brakes. This is the end of Claude Hill's brilliant chassis. This is the end and the most graceful version of Frank Feely's GT designed body. This is the end of the brilliant twin cam engine that W.O. Bentley designed for Lagonda that David Brown bought when he bought Lagonda. It's the end of the historic of production at the historic Feltham factory in England where David Brown built this whole generation of cars. There are a whole lot of ingredients in the makeup of this car that it sort of represents the ultimate sports car that England had to offer the world in the late 50s. I think the Mark III is really the most versatile. You can do just about anything with it. They're comfortable enough on the freeway that you can do that, but I wouldn't want to have a DB4 or 5 on the twisty bits. You know, those are GT cars. Those are made for going fast, long distances and arriving in comfort. But when Ian Fleming wrote Goldfinger in 1957, the gadget-filled Aston Martin, it was a Mark III. The movie was made in 1964. Sean Connery drives a DB5, but James Bond drives a Mark III. This isn't what I do for a hobby. This isn't what I did when I retired. This is my life. I've been tinkering with what we call these days mid-century sports cars since I was a teenager. The first sports car I ever owned was a 1953 Jaguar drophead coupe that I bought when I was a senior in high school. I knew nothing about automobiles at the time and it wasn't long before I realized if I was going to keep the car I needed to learn how to turn wrenches so I enrolled in a, a mechanic program. Back in those days there was nothing easy about owning old cars like this. You had to be incredibly resourceful because there were no parts for them. I started picking up an English magazine called Motorsport and in the back of Motorsport were classified ads that used to drive me crazy. After I sorted out the exchange rate, it was apparent that not only were there neat things in Europe, but they appeared good bargains. So, 1975, I actually started importing classic cars from England. And I generally went over with orders. The trip that I got this, 1984 actually, um, I'd gone to England specifically to buy a convertible version of this that a vendor in the Midlands had had for sale for uh, more than a year and I'd seen it in motorsport and we'd communicated uh, via snail mail. When I arrived at his establishment he had sad news for me that he'd sold that drop head on but he said by the way there's another Aston that I had but it's heading back to London you might want it it's the Mark III prototype. We headed back to London and then we were there when this thing rolled off the lorry. Uh, I was kind of love at first sight except for the color. This car came with an extensive archive of documents that included the entire set of engineers' reports on building this car. And being a small firm and being the 50s, I mean, a lot of the testing and engineering was really done seat of the pants. Testers would take it out and just flog the daylights out of it. 
and come back and write a report on what worked, what didn't work, what needed to be improved. So these documents in chronological order just lay out them preparing the launch of this new car. So it's unusual that the prototype survived because generally prototypes were scrapped because at the end of that process they weren't quite marketable. They kept the car around the works for three years. In the course of those three years, this car actually took a very amazing journey. When I bought this car, the vendor uh, correctly identified it as the prototype, but he also mentioned Monte Carlo. But there were no documents in the file to support that. I was on another buying trip to England. The British Grand Prix was at Brands. So of course we went, and I was just roaming through the stalls of this book vendor, and I found a book on Aston Martin. And as I'm thumbing through it, I actually find a photograph of this car on the water side of the Grand Prix circuit with the caption explaining Raymond Baxter, Jack Reese, Monte Carlo Rally. ka <laughs> The old cliche about the cobbler's kids have no shoes. I mean, it's the restorer rarely gets time to work on his own cars or restore his own. So, you know, having spent three decades in this trade and watching the whims come and go in the marketplace and, and particularly looking where the market is today where everything has to be Concord. I guess it's a blessing that this thing never got to the front of my list of objects to deal with because I may well have been tempted to restore it or sold it off to somebody who wanted it restored. Over the course of my ownership, I've actually used it a fair amount. It actually was in slightly better condition, but I would call it a, a, a nice used sports car. I sort of think it's been art directing itself over these years because rats have gotten to the carpet, the headliner's sagging, you know, it's got some dings and bangs of battle use, but um, to me, this car is perfectly awful. I love it just the way it is. When I sit in that seat, I channel Raymond Baxter, a famous BBC broadcaster and Spitfire pilot in World War II, and I can just imagine him on the Monte Carlo in the middle of the night in a ridiculously horrible blizzard, and somehow he got this car through all the way to Monte Carlo. I guess that's why I'm in this game. I mean, it's not about objects, it's not about possessions. It's about those objects' connections with stories and history and humanity.